We'll do it live. Do hey, it live. Hey, hey, the mics are open. All right. We are on we are on the air. We will take your phone calls now. <laughs> <laughs> Actually it'd be my wife at this junction that would take the phone calls because we're at the signal hole studio and the phone is off the hook down here, but it is on up there. And uh I she'll just confuse us with the bill collectors. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't want that on the air. No. We're gonna hide all no, that. No, we'll hide that stuff. She's she's pretty good about that stuff. What's up? Speaking of on the air, you brought up something that I think is very interesting at the top here. In honor of Charlie Parker, the week that has just ended, it was a great week of celebrating. Charlie, you asked me if Charlie knew that he was a genius. Yeah, maybe not. I would maybe not word it quite like that. What I would say is, did Charlie Parker know what kind of... uh, what kind of an influence that he was having, or that what kind of an influence he would have, or... You go ahead. What would be the answer? I, I think the the more I study and get into jazz, Charlie Parker is somebody that I didn't realize wielded as much power as he did. And I think he was so good that I don't know that he understood what he was doing. The way he laid out what he did was not anything that anybody's going to ever be able to replicate. He was creating an idiom, a language in bebop, and a way of playing an instrument that was unbelievable, surreal. Just in the process of doing that thing he did. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, well, some folks are, now that I think about it, some folks are just, uh, especially in the jazz uh, idiom, are just doing that thing they do. Yeah. Uh, Whether they're worried about whether they're going to make any ripples in the industry, uh, most of most of them could care less. Guys like Charlie Mingus, for instance, did did he know what kind of an influence he was going to have, or was it for him uh, mostly cathartic? Yeah, I th- I think for someone like Charlie and Miles, I think they knew how big of a shot they were. They had, I think, they had enough wealth. I think they accumulated enough world riches, and I think there was enough fans that really hopped on, and they were cognizant, and every album had pressure. Charlie was too mixed up in the drugs, in and out of Bellevue's, in and out of relationships and situations. Charlie was, it seemed to me to be the kind of guy that was hustling from one love to another, literally. Yeah, bird. Yeah. Yeah. Just just going into it. And he was he was a real... Like down to earth, he was a guy's guy. But I yeah. think Charlie and Miles were they were stars. They were jazz stars. You yeah. know. And I don't think Charlie was there. I think he was just a guy that's why he's bird. He scooped up that bird off the road so he can go and cook it. And he would have done that at the height of his popularity and wouldn't have thought twice that he's Charlie Parker getting a bird out of the middle of the road. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who hadn't heard it, that's how Charlie got his name. Yeah. Literally, they just stopped and scooped a bird out of the road and from then on in it was bird. Yep. Yard bird. That was yeah. it. Wow. <laughs> that was the one. So there is gonna be a quote. In, in the mix of this that I'm going to put in here that I think is very key about jazz, there was a gentleman by the name of Dan Pratt that I interviewed this week, and I was thanking him for being on the show and how much I enjoy jazz, and, and he does, and he said something along the lines of, take a listen. Right up front, I want to thank you for taking some time out to talk with me. I appreciate it. Of course. Thanks for the interest. I really appreciate the support. I took the opportunity to check out some of your uh, your previous episodes, and, and I liked your show. Right on. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. This is definitely a labor of love, for sure. Everybody involved with jazz does it because they can't they can't not do it. Huh. It's a hell of a quote. Yeah, it is. You know, I mean, it's that, that's that's what you do. You're not you're not doing this for anything more than you got the bug. You got to go with it. Yeah. Well, in that sense, uh, this has been uh, yours and my art form. Yeah. You know, not that somebody asked me the other day. He said, "You do you even care if you have listeners?" <laughs> 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 yes, I do. Uh, but that's part of the art, is being able to, and it, apparently in this industry, it's becoming rather a lust art. The idea that uh, it always was a one-on-one thing, broadcast or being behind a microphone and talking to somebody. I'm old. I, I, would, I would say that I'm old school in that regard. I know that when I'm speaking into a microphone, as I think you do too, that's one of the reasons we get along, I think, is because, uh, one of many reasons besides that, <laughs> <laughs> you don't bump around my things in the room too much. That's right. <laughs> no, but the, this, is a one, this is a one-on-one here. Right. You know, you, when we're talking into a microphone, yeah, there's a thousand people listening out there. 
but everybody's listening in an individual space. Yeah. Okay. So I'm for those from for you, my dear listener, that are on the other side of the speaker here. I'm talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm having a conversation with you, and I also uh, am fully aware. As I think when the guy, people that use the term you guys <laughs> aren't really too aware that they're in somebody's space. Yeah. And not just that, but invited there. Right. Okay. Um, I don't want to feel like I'm just being tolerated. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, that that's the way I've always kind of thought about visual art. That's something that I do as well. And when people get involved and buy artwork and want to make that commitment to hang it on the wall, that's a big commitment. And it's the same thing with this show, our shows. If someone tunes in and they want to listen to it, whether they pluck it down off Radio George or they go to a radio dial and they put it in, they're serious about listening to it. And you need to make sure that you're putting it out there for them. And they, it's relatable and that, you know, yeah. it's diggable. Yeah, it's, it's quite a job. I, I, this is kind of funny. The, the first program director that I ever worked for, I'm sitting behind a microphone. I have just left home i'm 500 miles away from home first job away from home i'm pretty young and uh i we make this sound easy i know but first time you ever sit behind a microphone and you realize you're on a uh, 10,000 watt station um the pd walked in set me down at the microphone first time i'd ever been on it before and he said all right in case you get nervous just realize if you mess up on the air 10,000 people are going to hear every mistake you make. <laughs> okay, good luck. Later. See you later. Clunk. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, radio, that's the way it is behind the mic. <laughs> good old Neil. I had, uh, had a couple of drinks with him in Omaha. He's uh, now part of the uh, KFAB radio group up there. He's still around, and I don't let him live it down either. <laughs> <laughs> One of my first experiences was at KGSP Park Hill, we had an indie show. There was a guy named Mark Trapasso, and one time we uh, put on a CD, went up to the roof to smoke a cigarette, and that thing we came back in was skipping and skipping. And I remember Mark had a lot more experience than me because that was intimidating at the time to be on the air. He looked over at me and he said, ah, don't worry about it, Joe. There's only like three people listening to it. Me, you, and some guy that accidentally got us as he drove by the college. So we, we didn't have much to worry about. <laughs> yeah, three watts, uh, you don't have to feel too threatened. No, everything's good. <laughs> well, uh, the art world. Yeah. Uh, it's like uh, Barbara Streisand sings in that Broadway album. Art isn't easy. <laughs> it, it, it's not easy at all. No. Nope. The one thing I do want to bring up, speaking of art, yes. one of the joys of this job is that I get packages on a regular basis in my mailbox. As long as they don't tick. That's right. It's not a ticking thing. This is just a benign package. And this one is from my friend Jason Paul at Red Cat Publicity. He's up there in New York, and I, I'm literally going to open this up on the air. And the beauty of this is that all the time I'm getting amazing music from these guys. And let's see who this is, if I can get it out of here. I right. say, you really packed it in there, didn't you? <laughs> packed he? it in. This here is the great Frank Carlberg, the World Circus, No Money and Art. Wow. Speaking of what we've been talking about with doing it because you love it. Yeah, Frank Carlberg's Word Circus. And he is an amazing artist. I've interviewed him before. Yeah. And uh, I knew And the name of it is out. No Money in Art. Exactly. Wow. And there is a uh, <laughs> old dude slunker down there just looking like he could uh, use a hunk of bread. But that's beautiful. That goes into what we're saying, and uh, we'll have to profile this underneath us as we uh, do our thing. As one uh, fellow tune to another, it's, uh, it's what kind of a little joke we uh, have at work at the radio station group where I uh, have my full-time job. We uh, look at one another and said, uh, we, we got into this because we loved it. Sure wasn't the money. <laughs> it's never the money. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good thing too. That's right. That's right. It's be, yeah. It's the love. That's it. That's the beauty of it. You know. But uh, a- anything you do, I will tell you this right now. This gig that I have, this is the this is the greatest thing that I can imagine. Coming in here, no pressure. We're doing what we love, and we're laying it down the way we want to. Stepping over the cat pan, coming that's into right. the studio, <laughs> and just uh, jawing into a microphone. And, and knocking into the keyboard, into whatever the else. Metal stick. <laughs> For those of you who just uh, joined us and didn't hear the last show that we've done yet uh, while we were sitting here, 
Uh, what was it you knocked over? I knocked over the. Uh, I knocked into the keyboard. Oh, here the keyboard. At, okay. At the terminal, and then I I knocked my glasses into the microphone after that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of a reaction, chain reaction thing. This is not a big room, uh, despite the panoramic uh, photo that uh, that I have displayed on my radio page. Uh, this is actually uh, not much bigger than a bedroom in here. Yeah. And uh, it's stuffed full of equipment and CDs. And uh, he uh, kind of rolled his elbow over there and just about brought an entire uh, <laughs> record shelf down on himself. <laughs> it's like those forklift videos. <laughs> that one dude knocks into one and the entire thing falls down. The whole place yep. just erupts. So it wasn't that bad. But yeah, it, it, speaking of things falling down, <laughs> I think we've... Uh, I think we've knocked another one down here. I think we have. Anyway, have a great week, kids. Be talking to you later. Enjoy your lives. Yep, and enjoy the music, my friends. That's right, and the jazz. Ciao. Ciao. Don't let it break your heart But there ain't no money, honey No money, you know Neon Jazz.